Chandler Kansen. I'm a neuropsychologist and the author of Hardwiring Happiness in Buddha's Brain. And I'm very pleased to be here with you all as part of the Loving Brain interview series. I have with me today Sarah Gottfried, MD, Harvard trained obstetrician and gynecologist. Also has some background at MIT as well, which appeals to the geek in me. And her wonderful book, The Hormone Cure is just out now from Simon & Schuster, 2013. Uh, Sarah's been um, had featured and profiled in many, many uh, magazines and mainstream publications. Uh, she's known for this very cool blend of being, I must say, very hip and also rock solid smart as a physician. So you kind of get the best of both worlds with her. Plus, as a mother of, uh, I think, two girls, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and right. just a great person all the way around, I'm very pleased to be with her today. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Rick. I'm so happy to be with you today. Okay, that's great. Well, let me ask you the question I start with everybody, which is, why has it been important to you personally to get good at your relationships? Well, my answer might be a little bit different from what other people would say to you. I think it's the best possible thing for your biology. And what I mean by that is your skillfulness really determines how you upgrade your biology, whether we're talking about your telomeres, which is one of the measures of longevity, or we're talking about your neurohormonal dashboard. I just really think that skillfulness is important as a path not as a destination, but as a process. How have you gained yourself from your skillfulness, whether it's with your biology or your interpersonal psychology? Well, I, I am an MIT biohacker, so I always rely on the data when I answer that question. And the way I've gained is, you know, if, if I had to think of one surrender point in my life where I got clear about the loving brain and relationships and skillfulness. It was about 10 years ago when I was struggling with feeling premenstrual. I was working in McMedicine at the local health maintenance organization. I felt like I was working on an assembly line. I was a working mom. You're right, I have two daughters. And I just, I felt way too young to feel so old. I was just at this place in my life where I felt a bit victimy, honestly, victimy, in that I blamed my husband for a lot of my misery and I would try to transition from that anger and rage at the end of a work day with a glass of wine. And we all know that doesn't work very well. And so that's a point where I went to my doctor and explained what was going on and I was offered two things, the latest antidepressant and also a birth control pill. And that was a defining moment for me because I realized, you know, this is not the right solution. This feels like exactly the wrong way to go about improving the quality of my life and the quality of my relationships. My marriage especially was suffering at that point and we were in couples therapy. And when I had that surrender point of kind of realizing, I don't think a pharmaceutical is gonna solve this problem and I stepped into owning my situation, and I had a hunch that my problem was hormonal. I tested my own hormones. I realized that my stress hormones were just sky high. They were about three times higher what they should have been, cortisol in particular. And it took me about a month to get my cortisol into the normal range again, but it just made such a difference, Rick, because that's where I shifted from blaming my husband for a lot of the struggle that I felt and I was able to shift my own biology so that life became a lot easier. And I was able to offer more skillfulness to my relationship and to realize that it wasn't external circumstances dictating the quality of my life. That's really interesting. And for people who have seen other um, interviews, one of the neat things about having you on this, um, Sarah, is that we can really talk about the mind-body connection. And to make a point here, uh, you had relationship issues. In other words, you were dealing with things emotionally and psychologically. Uh, I'm sure you were addressing them uh, both through therapy as well as just knowing you. You're an assertive person, and I'm sure you were communicating. But you also realized that you had to take into account the hardware, not just the software. And so for me, it's great to have you on the series. 
as a way to really appreciate the importance of optimizing your hardware, your physiology, your body, this complex system, as a way to support the mind. So to that, maybe some foundational information here help us out. What are hormones and why should we care about them? Men and women both, but certainly especially women, because that's your own expertise. Yes, well, I, so I think of hormones in a really simple way. I think of them as being a text message in your body usually released from one organ or another, maybe from your brain, maybe from your thyroid gland in your neck, or your adrenal glands in your mid-back, and they travel to cells through the bloodstream usually to send a message. And that message could be, okay, it's time to boost metabolism, or the message might be, we're going to deplete you right now of serotonin. We're going to deplete you of the happy brain chemical that's responsible for mood and appetite and sleep because you've been chronically stressed too long. And what I found with the folks that I've worked with for the past 20 years, both men and women, is that often cortisol is like a runaway train. And we're not being skillful about how we're managing chronic stress. And that definitely has both short-term and long-term costs associated with it. And I think it's a very important part of the, the hard wiring that you're talking about. So let me just kind of recap. So hormones are molecules. The body makes them, right? And they get sent and they go around and they do things. Um, what, are some, what are the names of some common hormones that we might have heard of? You've said cortisol so far. Any others? Oh, yes. Well, I like to make these hormones come alive because, as you know, once you get into the biochemistry, you know, the eyes start to glaze over. So I think of the hormonal Charlie's angels for women. And those three hormonal Charlie's angels are your cortisol level, main stress hormone, estrogen, and thyroid. And for the guys, I think of it as the three amigos. The three amigos are cortisol, testosterone, and thyroid. Mm. And I'm not saying that those three hormones are, are governing everything in your body, but they're the 80-20 rule. You know, we know from economists that if you focus on 20% of efforts, we know that they yield 80% of results. And this is the 20% of effort that I want our listeners to put in. So how could it be that the rise and fall of these molecules, these tiny things in our bodies, could affect the degree to which we can be loving or patient or, or passionate uh, in our relationships? Well, it's, you know, the latest in hormone science is that it's more than just the rise and fall of these hormones. It's also what's, what's been called by Candace Pert the molecular sex between the hormone and the receptor for the hormone, which is like the lock on the door of a cell, and the hormone fits in like a key. So we need to upgrade the quality of molecular sex that's happening in our body, and it's not as simple as controlling the level of your hormones. This comes up, you know, what many people have heard of before is insulin resistance. That when you have a problem with chronic stress or you eat too much sugar, it can lead to an issue with your cells becoming numb to insulin. And the sex that's happening between insulin and the insulin receptor is not good. The same thing can happen with other hormones. You can have progesterone resistance, and that's the mechanism behind premenstrual syndrome. You can have cortisol resistance. If you have been, you know, kind of running around with what I would call a hot amygdala, <laughs> and you're always scanning for, you know, the latest threat, usually emotional or psychological, then that can lead to problems, depending on your DNA, depending on how skillful you are at dancing with stress. So that's an example of how this can affect your skillfulness in your relationships. So let's say that um, I'm working really hard and I'm kind of stressed out. And uh, let's say also that I'm, I'll just make up a story here. I'm a woman in my mid-40s, not yet menopausal, got a couple kids, I'm a little depleted. As you know, that was my first book about depleted mothers. But anyway, um, so here I have, I'm cortisol -y, I'm stressed, my, God, my amygdala is a little hot, I'm noticing in my relationships, I feel kind of irritable, and it's pretty easy for me to feel, ugh, let down. A, how could you tell that story in a biochemical way for us? And B, what could we start to do about it? 
Yeah, so I'm a big fan of the easy practical solutions because that woman that you just described, which happens to be about 91% of the clients who come to see me, many of whom have come to see you too, what I hear from them is they don't want some big project. You know, just, just tell me straight what to do. So what's happening for them is that cortisol, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of lay it out as simply as possible. Cortisol, when you're under chronic stress, cortisol is designed to manage your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and your immune system. When you are chronically stressed, like I was in my 30s, and I had cortisol in the morning that was three times what it should have been, that was dragging down my other hormones. So it was slowing down my thyroid. I gained 25 pounds in my 30s, and I'm not just talking about with the babies that I had. And it also led to estrogen dominance, and it worsened my premenstrual syndrome. So we know that women who have higher cortisol levels have a greater risk of premenstrual syndrome. Their PMS is worse. So it's just, it's an amplifier, a negative amplifier. Like, we, we don't want that. What do you do about it? I think the first step is always awareness. That seems to be the answer to almost everything. And then the second step is to find the natural solutions that are not suppressive, but really start to move the needle in the direction of getting a hormone like cortisol into balance. And what I found, Rick, is that all paths lead back to cortisol. You know, it's not that you have to really take on each of these hormones individually, because cortisol is really the final common pathway that most of us need to manage differently. And the cool part is that it's very tangible. You can manage your cortisol the way you manage your 401k. So how do you do that? I'll just give you a few solutions. When I was in my 30s, I started taking phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine. The cool thing about Google is you can spell that any way you want, and you'll still be able to find it. So phosphatidylserine. Another is rhodiola. And it was the combination of those two supplements together with learning how to hit the pause button that I really was able to shift my cortisol level into that Goldilocks position of not too high, not too low. Do you want to say more what our hypothetical person could do, this uh, woman who's uh, you know, stressed and kind of frazzled and fried, but also feels like when she tries to hit the gas pedal, ugh, nothing happens, which of course affects her relationship. You know, she's more irritable, she's less patient, she's not naturally very interested in sex, no. little things hit her hard. Um, and then, then you have these secondary problems with the, you know, where she's feeling mad at herself for not being the kind of mother or person or mate she wants to be, let's say. So in addition to taking two supplements, phosphatidylserine and rhodiola, what else could you recommend for this person? Well, I like to start off with the low-hanging fruit, and I think supplements can make the difference so that you're able to shift into the next layer of work, which is really about perception of stress. Mm. You know, if we take a moment and step into the lab of Elizabeth Blackburn, the, the Nobel laureate at UCSF who did her work on telomeres, got the Nobel in 2009, she did a lot of her original work. Can you say what telomeres are? They are the caps on the ends of DNA and explain why they matter. Yes, yeah, so telomeres are the cute little caps on your chromosomes that determine your biological age as opposed to your chronological age. And they shorten as you get older, but some of us shorten a little too fast, especially women who have chronic high perceived stress. And this is not just you know, some good idea that you need to manage stress differently. That's not what I'm saying. That generic advice, I think, is not very helpful. But what Elizabeth Blackburn found is that premenopausal women with high perceived stress, not the stress itself, but perceived stress, on average age 10 years faster than women who had a normal amount of perceived stress. And she looked at women who had a very sick child in the intensive care unit at UCSF and compared them to women who had a healthy child. And it was the perceived stress that really made the difference. So let me interrupt. You're saying the difference was not whether the child was healthy or ill, but the mother's, the person's perception of her circumstances as more or less stressful or not. In other words, her mind, her appraisal, her view about what was happening 
uh, really affected how her, how her emotions and her body reacted to it. That's what you're saying, correct? That's exactly right. And I feel like this is a place where we want to leverage the best of neuroscience to help women with that chronic perceived stress and not necessarily say across the board, okay, you need to start meditating for 30 minutes every morning because most women who are under high chronic perceived stress don't find that helpful. But I do think that the next layer is to understand how do you hit the pause button? How can you work that into your life? How can you do it when you're with your children? How can you do it in your morning? You know, can you, is there something you could do when you brush your teeth? I'll give you an example. I have one of those, those toothbrushes, you know, the, I forget what it's called, Sonicare or something like that. And I put my hand over my heart and imagine inhaling into my heart and exhaling out from my heart while I'm brushing my teeth. Mm. It's about two to three minutes and I think about someone that I love and I just imagine that person and how much I love them and how connected I feel to them mm. for two to three minutes. It doesn't take any extra time in my day and it's those kind of needle movers that I think are important to bring to our lives so that we're really able to bring our best biology forward to our relationships. So to push on this a little bit, um, I mean, I can imagine a person at this point saying, look, you know, I've got a sick kid in the ICU, or look, I've got a really tough job, or look, you know, I've got chronic pain. I mean, it just isn't shutting down. I got chronic pain. I have real difficulties. Or, you know, I'm, I'm being targeted systematically because I'm, you know, because of my race or my sexual orientation or my, or my weight. Uh, what do you mean perceived stress? In other words, I have these tough situations to deal with. How can I relate to them differently while still dealing with them and not mess up my telomeres and die 10 years sooner than another person? Great question. And I, you know, my mind first goes to someone like Viktor Frankl, who is a Holocaust survivor. And he, he spoke to this issue very beautifully and I'm paraphrasing him, but he said something like, in the gap between stimulus and response lies your freedom. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is the horizontal that cuts through all of those situations, where no matter your circumstances, you have the ability to upgrade your response to your situation. And it's true that some people face much worse circumstances than others. We can, you know, debate whose is worse, you know, chaos mas macho or chaos is mas, you know, terrible. And I, I think it's important to realize that no matter what your stressors are, it's that gap between stimulus and response where you're going to be able to find your skillfulness. So I've got my child in the ICU, right? Or I've got, you know, I'm in a situation where I realize that I'm not going to get hired because I'm fill in the blank. You know, I, I'm older, I'm, you know, I'm black, I'm whatever. Or, you know, I just discovered that my partner has been fooling around or something. You know, I'm dealing with these stresses. These are real situations. Mm -hmm. Stimulus has occurred. Now there's a gap for my response. Mm -hmm. What could I do in that gap, mm -hmm. both psychologically and even physiologically, in addition to what you've said so far. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I like how you frame this. And I, you know, what I would say is, in that situation, I want to paint two different pictures. You know, say you just found out that your partner is cheating on you, and you feel betrayed. You feel rage. You feel loss and grief, you know, all at the same moment. Anger, frustration, devastation. I think it's important to realize that you have a choice, that there is the choice that I was making by default in my 30s, which was as a working mother, I had cortisol and stress levels in my body that were sky high. So I had cortisol kind of running the show. When I realized that, you know, when I had that defining moment in my doctor's office and I was looking at that prescription for Prozac 
and for a birth control pill, and it just felt all wrong to me. When I realized that, I found the gap. It wasn't overnight. I mean, I became a yoga teacher. I started to, you know, look at my hormones and how I could change them for the better. And I made this decision that I wanted to have a different relationship with my husband, and I wanted to do everything I could biologically, starting with my cortisol. Mm -hmm. Now, another choice would have been to kind of stay on that path with cortisol as a runaway train, right? Where what typically happens, I mean, this is very well documented, despite conventional medicine and how it kind of ignores cortisol and glucocorticoids and what they do to the brain, we have really excellent documentation showing that if I stayed on that path in my 30s with high cortisol, it would fry my hippocampus. My hippocampus, that lovely part of the brain where we do emotional regulation and uh, memory consolidation, and you could probably talk for 20 minutes about what the hippocampus does. It also depletes you of serotonin and dopamine, one of the neurotransmitters of pleasure and satisfaction. It made me you know, prefer to mop the floor than have sex with my husband. It made me... That's a um, low bar, if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Mopping floor. <laughs> and I don't like to mop the floor. So, you know, and it, we know that 50% of people with depression have high cortisol levels. So it's really important to realize that you have a choice. And if you're not making that choice, if you're not stepping into ownership or you're not choosing skillfulness, the default is that you're going to keep having these hormones manage you instead of you managing the hormones. Okay, that's great. So I want to say it back to you then ask you a question. So just to make sure I got it, in this gap, we have a, we have a tough stimulus, right? Yes. We're not sugarcoating the realness of the challenge. And obviously, part of life is to try to change our environment to the extent we reasonably can. But that said, as we probably a lot of us noticed, environments are kind of intractable. They don't change that quickly or easily oftentimes. Jean-Paul Sartre said, as you may know, hell, is other people. <laughs> you know? So they are what they are. Okay, They are the stimulus, and we have this gap. Right. In the gap, what I'm hearing you say quite poignantly is you got on your own side, and you, didn't, you had kind of a wake-up where you realized that you didn't want to be that proverbial frog who was slowly boiled to death one degree at a time in the pot of water, mm -hmm. that you really needed to make a course correction. And it, the second thing is it could take some time to make this shift. It didn't happen overnight. You said that. That was really important. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about ways that you started helping yourself uh, resource yourself, whether it's through taking supplements or learning to yoga and then becoming a yoga teacher, things like that. You resourced yourself to gradually, you know, calm down and become more resilient and become more, not that you were agitated, I mean, relax is a better word than calm down, um, so that you could deal with these stressors. Right? So all that's really clear. So I have a question for you. Um, Can I interrupt you for one moment? Because, yeah. you know, we started off talking about maybe a person who's been betrayed. And I, I feel like I didn't close that loop. Could I just close that oh, loop? Oh, yeah, briefly? sure. Or, just, and, or someone who's being discriminated against yes. or someone who's got a child in the ICU. Yeah. Yes, a very challenging set of stressful circumstances. So I feel like, you know, one path is to feel that awful, horrendous feeling, for instance, of finding out that your husband's having an affair and going down that path of cortisol sky high, maybe dropping too low and you feel exhausted, don't want to get out of bed, maybe having depression or just, you know, kind of normal grief. Another strategy, and of course this wouldn't happen the day that you find out this information, but another strategy is to say, what if I assume 50% ownership of my husband having an affair? What if I just do this as a thought experiment and look at my side of the street and look at my 50% that could lead to this particular behavior? And I, I think it's very different to be kind of managed by all of those stress hormones and the neurotransmitters that are interdependent with those stress hormones versus that ownership and kind of realizing how much you can step into skillfulness and how that then helps to manage and control your hormonal Charlie's Angels. So I just wanted to close that loop on, you know, a major stressor that comes up and sort of these two different paths. And the two paths very succinctly could be grow or die. 
Well, we've uh, suddenly stepped into some uh, thin ice here, so I want to kind of sort things out. I mean, okay. it's one thing to take, obviously, to take responsibility for our own experience of the stimulus. In other words, Frankel did not take responsibility for the Holocaust or for the Nazis. Yes. He did yes. not think about what's my 50% uh, responsibility for being here in Auschwitz. He did look at deeply what's my capability, what are my resources that I can use in how I respond to this horrible, horrible situation. So I think it's important to make a distinction between yes. responsibility for our experience and responsibility for the behavior of other people. I mean, maybe we have some role to play in some way, but there's so many other factors and obviously, I think that um, there are a lot of risks. It's a lot of trickiness around taking any kind of responsibility for being horribly mistreated, whether you're a Jew in Germany in the 30s or a man or woman whose partner has cheated on you. And so I just want to, I think that's a very important distinction, um, especially historically, in a context which is, maybe you want to respond to what I've said so far, but then I'll, I'll just take, I'll, tag this on because they're related to me. How do we, Sarah, uh, especially women, I think, um, how do we take responsibility over here for our emotional reactions to things and doing what we can over here, but how do we do that without falling into the pitfall that has historically happened an awful lot of the time in which women were told, oh, it's all in your head, mm. you're overreacting, the circumstances, the stimulus, if you will, is just fine. There's nothing wrong with the stimulus. Your response is just up to you. And how do we avoid the pitfall of people feeling somehow blamed for their reactions to a crummy situation? Um, and also, this responsibility is all on them to, to deal with their reactions rather than responsibility being on some of the sources of those reactions. Yes, great, great question, and thank you for that clarification on um, how much responsibility we need to take. I mean, certainly that is part of the equation, but I also think that when we look at our own biology and how we allow external factors to affect us, and we talk about the skillfulness of our intimate relationships, I do think that that's where it's important to look at our perception of stress and to test it in different ways, kind of reality test it in different ways. So to take your point about women and just this long history that we have of being told, oh, you're just hormonal, you're just overreacting, why don't you take this nice sleeping pill? We know that women have twice the rate of prescriptions for insomnia and sleeping pills as men do. They have double the rate of depression and use of antidepressants compared to men. And I am really careful not to over-pathologize women while also saying that the women that I've worked with in the past 20 years tell me every day that when they're in this situation of knowing that they're managing stress poorly or not as skillfully as they could be, that it feels like a moral failing. Hmm. It, it feels like there's there's a, a way in which they are not able to step into skillfulness and that um, it, there's this, this scritchy quality to it that is very undermining. And what I want to say, you know, the conversation I want to change around that is that I, I ask that you look at your biology. I ask that you start with not just the emotional and psychological issues, but alongside those psychological and emotional issues, look at the biology. How can we help both? How can we do these parallel tracks? You know, the software and the hardware, I think, is, as you might describe it. So I, I'm a big fan of, of just making sure that we're not ignoring the biology and blaming women for feeling fat, cranky, like they can't sleep, hypervigilant, that they don't want to have sex. I think it's important to start with the biology. You know, if we just take, for instance, low sex drive, which I think is a very important part of the challenges that people have in long-term monogamous relationships. 
we know that um, about 70% of low sex drive is hormonal. There's certainly other factors. I want to be really clear that I don't want to be overly reductionistic about the issues that men and women face and say that it's all hormonal because that's not true. It's part of a much bigger context of emotional connectivity and the loving brain, et cetera. But we know that if you start with the biology in low sex drive and you address some of those hormonal issues that are the root cause of low sex drive, that can take you pretty far. And it can even make it more effective for you to then address the skillfulness and some of that emotional connectivity that you have in your relationship. So I hope, I hope that's somewhat clear. I just think it's important, as you stated, to, to not over-pathologize women and to look with a very objective, clear-eyed glaze, eyes wide open, at the biological determinants. So you have a really complex mind, which is one of the reasons why I'm <laughs> really happy we're talking here. So we have MIT a biohacker, and we have Harvard MD, and we have yoga teacher, you know. And then we throw in mom and uh, some rock and roll, I'm sure. So... <laughs> Well, I'm hoping you're going to simplify it for me, Rick. <laughs> I don't know, simplify, but, you know, bit by bit. Uh, so first point, I think you're saying to me really helpfully that two things can be true side by side, and it's not either or. In other words, on the one hand, we could look hard at our environment, at all kinds of things, our partner, our partner not doing the dishes. Uh, we can look hard at all kinds of things out here, and and acknowledge their contribution and their, the role they play in our lives and have the kind of dignity to admit the ways that we're affected by these things, you know, to honor, in a sense, the way they affect us. While, so at the same time, recognizing that we probably have fairly limited influence over these circumstances, we do everything we can, but in addition to that, we really be a friend to ourselves, help ourselves feel better, whether that's intervening in our physiology or intervening in our psychology, mm. side by side, and it's not either or. The one doesn't, you know, intervening in your mind or your body doesn't let your partner or patriarchy or late stage capitalism off the hook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so to me, that was the first thing you were saying. That was really, really good. Thank you. Um, that was nicely stated. And I would say that side by side, there also there's a lot of crosstalk between them. Right, yeah. so the psychology changes the biology, the biology changes the psychology. Right, and to that point, the more we resource ourselves over here, the more we can do stuff over there. And the more we fiddle over here, social change or, you know, housework change, what have you, the more we have capabilities over here to shore ourselves up. So that's good. And then the second thing you were getting at, which I think is really interesting, is the way I put it is what's the target? Is the target hardware physiology or is the target the mind psychology and second what's the intervention and a key point here which is implicit in your work is that you can use mental interventions to target physiology just like you can use physical interventions like phosphatidylserine or what have you or you know a testosterone supplement to target physiology similarly you can intervene in physiology to target your mind you know, if you want to improve how you think about things, you can um, take some supplements that, you know, balance your cortisol over time, or you can work on your attitudes and things like that. So just because a target is physiological or, or psychological doesn't mean that the intervention needs to be psychological or physiological, right? You mix and match them really, really effectively. Well, Dr. Claire? I, yes, thank you. I, I think um, maybe I could write my next book with you because you, <laughs> you're very... <laughs> I love, I love your clarity. I mean, you just really made such a cogent um, explanation of this. And I also, you know, I think it's very important. One of the ways I look at this, maybe in a more hierarchical way, is that we've been focused maybe for the past 20, 40, 50 years on hormones in the realm of hormone science, gynecology, endocrinology. Um, and it's not just the downstream hormones that we want to pay attention to. We want to look upstream at the control systems. And I think, to me, that's where the psychology and the brain, the emotional piece really plays a role. And I would even say that the heart 
may even be at the top of the hierarchy. Hmm. There's new evidence to suggest that what I learned in medical school was really that your adrenal glands, which make most of the sex hormones in men and women, they make cortisol and estrogen and testosterone and progesterone. I used to think that your adrenals were managed by your brain, mm. especially the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. Mm. But now I believe from, from really cutting edge data that your brain listens to what the heart tells it. Mm. So ultimately the heart tells the brain to tell the adrenals what to do. So that's where I think the loving brain and um, skillfulness really becomes very interesting. Yeah, uh, one of the things that's really striking is how much I think of the love as a universal medicine. I mean, love in terms of our three core needs, right, for safety, satisfaction, and connection, loosely linked to the reptilian, mammalian, and primate human systems. Um, love makes us feel safe. When we're loving as well as when we feel loved, that helps us feel safer, reduces the sense of threat. Also, love is deeply rewarding, takes care of those reward systems, you know, that part of the the brain-mind connection. And also, love is, of course, uh, very connecting. So I want to ask you, because I have a vested interest in this question, as a guy. Oh, good. You guys have hormones, too? <laughs> yes. You have hearts? Yes, yes, yes. You for us. <laughs> I have a lot to say to the guys. You know, my, my first book, um, The Hormone Cure, is written for women. And my, my husband said, okay, is your next book going to be for guys? And I said, I don't know. Do they need a book or an app? Well, they need a book, but they don't read books, so we'll get to that later, but anyway. Okay, so here's what I think is important for men, and again, I'm really careful about this because I think there's so much of a dynamic system happening. I, I think of the body, if we just take a moment to step it back for a moment and look at hormones in context, I think about the body as this matrix. You know, this is kind of the basis of functional or integrative medicine. I think about the body as a matrix, and... Hormones are just one piece of about seven different systems. I'll put on my MIT bioengineer hat here, where there is this complex web happening in your body, and the hardware and the software that you're talking about is, those are important parts of the system's biology. And for men, I'm going to be reductionistic for a moment, but I want to try to keep this in context, and I know you'll keep me honest here. So... <laughs> When you're always a... honest. I might keep you simpler. But, you okay, know. well, that's, that's good. So when it comes to men, here's what I see happening for men. For both men and women, starting in our 30s, I think that many of us begin to fall down a hormonal flight of stairs if we don't become skillful about our relationships, whether that's with a loved one, children, work, parents, all of the above. And for women, it happens a little faster. It happens typically in the 30s with the change that occurs with progesterone and estrogen. So the first phase of perimenopause typically occurs between 35 and 45. For men, a much more gradual shift can start to happen, usually in their late 30s, maybe their 40s. And that is, instead of the relationship of progesterone to estrogen, the relationship between testosterone and estrogen starts to change. So as you well know, men have a lot of testosterone, especially 18 and through their 20s, and that starts to decline typically around 40. And estrogen starts to climb. Now, some people talk about this as andropause. I think it's a little bit more complex than the slow decline of testosterone. And what happens, the way this, this looks in a man is that sometimes drive or ambition starts to shift. It can lead to lower sex drive, mm -hmm. which may be a good thing. It can lead to man boobs. It can lead to more love handles as estrogen climbs and testosterone goes down and you don't bulk up quite as much in response to exercise. Heart disease can become a greater risk. In fact, the ratio of testosterone to estrogen was just proven to be an important predictor of heart disease in men. So many of these shifts start whoop, to happen. Whoop. You got people's attention there. So <laughs> when you say the relationship between testosterone and estrogen is a predictor of heart disease, I'm assuming you mean um, a sort of 
excessively as an excessive drop of testosterone relative to estrogen is a risk for men, correct? That is correct. Okay, keep going. Yes, and so if I had to simplify, I would call this um, very affectionately grumpy old man syndrome. <laughs> when men start to feel grumpy and just, you know, not as full as joie, of joie de vivre as they used to feel. So women have their own version, but I think this is something that we see in men commonly. And I also believe, although this is less proven, this is more conjecture, hypothesizing, I believe that the way that men manage stress and their perception of stress determines how fast they decline in their testosterone and then the, the father of testosterone is DHEA. And you can decline a little faster, like 2% per year, if you're not managing skill, skillfully the stress in your, in your life. The other po important point, I think I'm curious about this and what you think about this, Rick, because you are a world expert. I find that women and the role of relationships, like women who have more unskillful, more toxic relationships, I find that it derails them very strongly. I think that happens for men too, but I think women are more vulnerable when it comes to unskillful relationships and how that impacts their mood, their sleep, their telomeres, their um, longevity, their risk of depression. And I'm curious if you've noticed over your career a difference, a gender difference in terms of unskillful relationships. Yeah, a couple things here. So first off, uh, I would definitely not describe myself as a world expert <laughs> on gender differences and responses to stress. So first off, um, I will say that a couple points here. First point, again, just to kind of mirror back what you're saying. That's what I do as a therapist, right? I say I back so to appreciate people. it. But anyway, <laughs> um, if I had a pipe, I would do something with the background. So number one, you're really emphasizing that stress is not good for us when it's chronic and especially when we have a sense of inescapability about yes. In other words, we evolved to have the capability to ramp up uh, and Mother Nature's blueprint is that that spike of stress is supposed to be brief and hopefully not too severe followed by a long green period of recovery. I think of red zone stress, a lot of green, that's Mother Nature's plan. Problem is modern life gives us mild to moderate stress, typically not a a severe spike, usually. We're not running for our lives screaming from a lion, but we have chronic mild to moderate red zone that we never get out of. Or if we get out of, we often do so in a way that's problematic, has a lot of collateral damage, like drinking too much or eating too much or, or what have you. And so then what to do about that? So I think one of your key points is, from a biochemical standpoint, is to appreciate that stress just doesn't feel bad. You know, chronic stress actually does stuff like wears down telomeres, these caps at the ends of chromosomes and DNA that, you know, leads to age-related diseases. Um, you know, the stress messes with our hormonal system. And a woman's hormonal system is, of course, more complex than a man's is because every so she has to be prepared to build the most complex organ the body ever builds because it contains all the other organs and then expel it in this intense process that historically was often fatal, right? So, of course, she's got more of a complex system. Stress messes with all that, and it can have lots of impacts on her relationships as well as her physical health and longevity and general well-being. So, you know, a key thing, I think, is to appreciate the pernicious effects of stress. And we live in a culture in the West, especially America, that kind of valorizes stress, that makes it special. You know, if you're not stressed, you must not be fully fulfilling your own needs. And the key point, of course, as you all know, you can be revved up, but as long as you have positive emotion, you're doing okay. That trouble comes when negative emotion is mixed in with stress. That's when the difficulty becomes. So that's point one. Point two, you know, how do women and men, how are they differentially affected by relationship troubles? And to get to that one, which I want to bounce it back to you, of course, uh, I'm going to handle my stress because I need more power for my computer here. So we're going <laughs> to pause momentarily while I get a little computer, turn our recorder off, and then come back for what men and women can do with their stress in their relationships. Okay, so we'll be right back. So we're back. Um, I've now powered up my computer, 
Uh, for those who have any interest in this, I'm actually recording this from uh, a house in Cape Cod where I'm teaching for a week. So you're not seeing my normal converted laundry room office that <laughs> is the backdrop of all the other uh, series that we've done. Uh, so where we left off, Sarah, you really threw an important question out, obviously about gender differences in response to interpersonal conflict. You know, as you well know, um, when we talk about gender differences, of course, it's a bit of a minefield. We've got to be thoughtful, I think appropriately, how we use our language. We're talking about the average of different groups, the male group, the female group, lots of individual differences. And sometimes, again, as you know, there could be a significant difference between these two bell curves, as it were, distributions. They don't always look like bell curves. But that difference, even though it's statistically significant, is not that consequential. Yes. even if it lets you get your paper on the New York Times. So all that said, um, it's interesting that the research shows that on the average, women are more demonstrative with regard to interpersonal conflict. This is a classic John Gottman finding. Mm -hmm. But men who look more stoic internally, speaking of physiology and cortisol and their inner stressometer, their stressometer, whew, they're definitely pegged in the red zone and stay much longer. The woman may climb up behaviorally in terms of overt expression, but she tends on average to come down, whereas the man uh, seeds longer and longer and longer, which I think is maybe one of the contributing factors to the longevity differential between men and women. They're more you know, internalizers and imploders, uh, often, not always, as a generalization. But I think, to the point, both sexes, including if they're in a same-gender relationship, a same-sex relationship, it's really important to be careful about the wear and tear of the daily grind, you know, adding up over time. So I wanted to ask you about that wear and tear, because you're a pro, you're a physician. First of all, when should a person, a man and woman alike, in terms of the general territory we're talking about, stress-related illnesses or conditions of different kinds, when should a person go talk to their doctor rather than playing around with do-it-yourself medicine? Great question. And I, I really feel that it's never too early to go see your clinician or go see your doctor. I think the sooner the better, and you certainly would not want to make any changes in your medications or take any of the supplements that I talk about without a clear diagnosis. Now, one of the things I offer in my book, The Hormone Cure, is a questionnaire. It's a questionnaire that I've been using in my practice for the past 20 years, and it helps to identify the root cause of some of the symptoms you struggle with, whether that's hair loss or rage in your relationship or weight gain. So I, I use Loss questionnaires. of libido. Loss fatigue. of libido. So there's 128 items, honestly, in my book. It's a checklist that you can use to figure out the root cause. But what I think is important, you know, as, as, a, as a systems biologist, it was really important to me to, to have a bright line between what you could do yourself and what you need to do with a clinician. And I divided my approach, which is how you eat, move, think, and supplement, into three different stages. The first stage is that you're filling in nutritional gaps. So that includes things like, you know, if you have a slow thyroid, like I did in my 30s, it includes things like getting copper. How would a person know they have a slow thyroid? Through testing or through feeling their neck? Well, so with a slow thyroid, what you could do is you could flip to this section of my book in Chapter 1 where I have all the questionnaires, and they include things like weight gain, fatigue, do you have hair loss, are the outer third of your eyebrows, you can see them on my eyebrows right now, the outer third is a little skimpy compared to the inner two-thirds. That's a sign of a slow thyroid. So you can take questionnaires like this. I even have a free quiz that we can offer to our listeners. It's on my website. Should I mention that just yeah, as a please. strategy? So it's thehormonecurebook.com forward slash quiz. Thehormonecurebook.com forward slash quiz. And you can take this quiz. It's a modified, smaller version of what I have in the book. And that then tells you... It's free, right? It's free. So it's, it's a way to look at the root cause rather than to jump to masking symptoms with the latest pharmaceutical. So step one is that you're filling in nutritional gaps and you're making the lifestyle tweaks that really start to move the dial. So for instance, if you have PMS, we know that exercise, not hardcore exercise, but moderate exercise, walking four times a week for 30 minutes makes a difference in randomized trials 
for premenstrual syndrome. That's the best evidence we have. Step two is to take proven botanical therapies. I mentioned that I took rhodiola for my high cortisol. When you move to step two, I think it's very important to consult with a physician or a clinician of your choice so that you really are clear that your diagnosis is correct. Step three is proven botanical therapies, and I find that most people don't need those. But when you do need um, bioidentical hormones, did I say botanicals again? Um, <laughs> so step three is bioidentical hormones, but at the smallest doses and for the shortest duration. So that's my strategy, and I consider it progressive. You start with step one. If you are not feeling better in terms of your particular symptoms, then you consult with your clinician before moving to step two, the proven botanicals and certainly before step three, the bioidentical hormones. But I find 95% of the time, men and women can balance their hormones without a prescription. So that doesn't mean that you don't want to see your clinician, and you might have some suggestions here too, but certainly when you have depression and you have any suicidality, if you are thinking about hurting yourself, if you feel for two weeks that your mood is terrible and you don't want to get out of bed and um, you're just not able to function. Those are the kind of things that you would definitely want to go see a clinician for. Some of this is common sense, but I think when it comes to the symptoms that we're talking about related to hormones and the loving brain, I think the, you know, step one you can definitely do on your own. That's great. Okay, so let's, let's kind of think of a couple examples here. So let's take... Uh, uh, let's start with a woman. Let's say a woman in um, her, I'll just use my person before, you know, early 40s, couple kids, decent relationship, not great, not bad, decent. And she just feels kind of like she's running on fumes, you know. She gets out of bed, she works, she can still have some pleasure, she's not clinically depressed, um, but they're just kind of, eh. And let's say, let's kind of put that in there that um, she just has no natural interest in sex. There's a willingness, let's say, to be direct here, she's capable orgasmically, but there's not a natural movement in that direction. So in terms of, let's say, two targets, okay? One, general vitality, and two, let's say, increase in libido. And let's also say that she's talked to her GP, they've run some tests, she's She's kind of low normal this, low normal that. The usual thing that people typically in managed care will kind of wave their hands at and go, you're fine, go out of here. You're just overworked, whatever. You need to go to Hawaii, you know, right? <laughs> so just kind of there. What could this person do hypothetically in terms of your non-prescription toolkit and not even needing to read your book if that's okay, but what could this person do for these two things? One, lack of vitality and two, lack of libido. Mm -hmm. well, when I, I say do, I mean in the physiological side. Let's suppose that she's, you know, working on her point of view. She's, you know, practicing some more mindfulness. Okay, that's great. She's working the mental side of it, and she's talking to her partner, and she's doing that. But still, you know, she hits that gas pedal, and nothing happens inside. Mm -hmm. What can she do? Well, I Several things, and um, again, this is something I see every day in my practice, so my heart goes out to this person, and, um, you know, if I, if you think about those Venn diagrams, you know, the overlapping circles of vitality and sex drive, there's a lot of overlap between them, right? If mm -hmm. you don't feel vital, sex is not going to be at the top of your dashboard. You sex know? is draining if you don't feel vital. It's, it's not energizing. It's draining. So, you know... It's hard for me to totally pull out the mindfulness practices because I think those are embedded in the physiology. But what I would say to someone like that is um, I would say let's create your top five list of how to hit the pause button. And I say it because, you know, if we are using this uh, foot on the gas pedal analogy, if we could go a little bit further with that, I would say let's look at race car drivers where they, you know, put the pedal to the metal and they get a response. They don't develop mastery from just having the pedal to the metal all the time. They develop mastery from knowing when to take a strategic pit stop, knowing when to get their crew to help them before they blow out their tires, before they feel like they're depleted and they've run out of gas. 
So I would take a step back and say, okay, you're not getting anything when you press the accelerator. Let's figure out those strategic pit stops for you. And it might be calling a girlfriend and doing that for 10 minutes. You know, you were talking before about this gender difference between men and women, how we have to be careful about it. But I, I love this, this idea from one of the, it might be the current or the previous chief of psychiatry at Stanford who said, if you're a man and you want to have a long, healthy life, marry a woman. Be with a woman. If you're a woman and you want to have a long and healthy life, call a girlfriend. Be with a girlfriend. Spend time with women. And I'm not saying that women are the answer to everything and you must spend time with a woman, but we tend and befriend. And that can be a very nurturing thing, especially for someone who feels depleted. So calling a girlfriend, taking a hot bath, and I would throw in maybe some lavender and some Epsom salts because she's probably low in magnesium. I would say master your sleep because mm -hmm. it is a key way that we fall down a hormonal flight of stairs and then we get addicted to coffee and that's a whole other conversation how that raises cortisol. I would also say that you want to look at those hormonal Charlie's Angels. So you could start off just with doing the quiz that I mentioned at the hormonecurebook.com forward slash quiz. Look at your cortisol, look at your estrogen, look at your thyroid. And if you get those three into the neutral zone, the Goldilocks position, that's going to go a long way toward improving vitality and your sex drive. Now, the emotional connection, I'm just going to leave that to you, uh, Rick, because I think you're, you're so good at it. But we know that women are different from men when it comes to libido. Mm -hmm. and we could probably spend about an hour talking about that, but we know that women need an emotional connection to feel receptive to sex. And it's almost the opposite of what most men experience. Again, we're generalizing, but men often need sex to feel emotionally connected. It's a disconnect that causes a lot of problems in marriages until you, you get on top of it and sort of see it. You also mentioned, you were talking about a man and a woman and like how much the guy was doing the dishes. I consider dishes to be very important foreplay, and most women do too. <laughs> That's really good. Okay, great. Well, then, um, well, I, I still am interested. So take this person. So now, and you mostly named mental interventions. Um, what non-prescription, physical, physiological, uh, tangible, material interventions would you also think of, could, would you nominate as worth investigating for this woman who, by the way, for every one of these women who is in our office, there are a hundred or a thousand yes. just out in the world altogether. Yes. Okay, so what would you suggest physically uh, so, for this person? So let's, let's go a little further with our hypothetical. And I'll, you know, there's a woman that I saw yesterday who had this very issue and was in this demographic. And what we found with her was that she was in her early 40s in what I would call estrogen dominance. So she had a high level of estrogen, low level of progesterone. They were out of balance. Normally you want the balance to be such that you have about 500 times more progesterone molecules on day 21 of your cycle, if you're still cycling, compared to estrogen molecules, a ratio of 500, similar for um, for women after menopause. So the normal range is about 100 to 500, and there's several ways to measure this. We found that she was in estrogen dominance. She just didn't have enough progesterone, and that's very common once women start to run out of ripe eggs. Their ovaries are not producing the progesterone that they used to make. Now, progesterone is a bit like nature's Valium. It helps you feel calm and soothed, and it's, it's a really important nutrient for the brain. And I, I find that low progesterone is very common for women who feel like they just, you know, would, don't want to have sex with their husbands. So cortisol, either high or low, or even both within the same day, very common reason for low sex drive. Estrogen dominance or low estrogen, which tends to give you more vaginal dryness, sex can become painful. So high or low on the estrogen. And then low thyroid. I feel like low thyroid is the elephant in the room when it comes to low sex drive. And we're, you know, a lot of clinicians are still using an old standard 
for what constitutes a normal thyroid. So in addition to filling out the questionnaires, which really tell you about your experience with these hormones, I think it's important to do testing when it comes to your thyroid. You can also test your estrogen and progesterone. You can test your cortisol levels, but it's especially important when it comes to your thyroid. So how do you fix that? You know, say this woman, you know, she has her excess estrogen. Estrogen's a dominatrix in her body. What I find is helpful is to increase fiber. So this would be step one of the Gottfried Protocol. We know that fiber is so important for keeping estrogen in balance. It also lowers cortisol. And the average American's getting about 14 grams a day. You need three times that. And you have to gradually increase. You can't just go to 45 grams a day. You have to gradually increase. The other thing that I found was helpful with this particular woman was to give her an herb called chaseberry. And chaseberry is well proven for thousands of years, and it's been shown to increase your body's ability to make progesterone. And it helped this woman feel more soothed, it raised her progesterone level, and it also helped her with her sex drive. So those are a few examples of what you can do to manage these hormones without resorting to pharmaceuticals. All right, so right there, both fiber and chaseberry you can get in a health food store. Use it wisely and intelligently. Um, and I'm sure, as you well know, you know, having protein with every meal is helpful and balances insulin. Um, and doing what you can for sleep, I was really appreciative of you talking about that. Um, I think we have a few more minutes, so I'm going to, if I could, move to the last two questions I ask people. Um, so for you, if you uh, think about your own growing edge these days in relationships, you know, uh, we all have a growing edge. Uh, even people who drink out of big mason jars. Uh, <laughs> what are you working on? You know, what are you trying to help yourself uh, get better at, especially psychologically, if I can go there with you? Hmm. Well, I I am very committed to my growth edge. It's really important to me to to always be thinking about what I could do better. And you actually mentioned my growth edge earlier. You were talking about receiving love from other people in relationships and also giving love. Yeah. And what's a bit paradoxical to me, especially as a recovering, depleted, working mom, is that the more that I give and serve and love, the more energy I have. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a little bit tricky. There's a slippery slope there because women are, are wired to overgive. And I think when you can find that line between giving and overgiving, that's very powerful for women. So that's one of my edges, is trying to clarify that difference between giving and overgiving. You might think of it as providing versus overproviding, or caring versus overcaring. And most of us intuitively know the difference. I can tell you, I used to ask one of my daughters to empty the dishwasher. And then I would rush in and do about a third of it. When she is perfectly capable at 13 of emptying the dishwasher without me intervening and stepping in. That was an example of me overgiving. Women are often programmed to give until they drop. And that's not good for us. It's not good for anyone. So that edge is really important for me, kind of defining that difference between giving and overgiving, loving and overloving. Yeah. My hunch for women men alike, uh, whether they're in a same-gender relationship or heterosexual relationship or just dealing in life, is so much of the, what makes the difference uh, between giving and overgiving is part of what make, is related to what makes the difference in being activated passionately or being activated stressfully. In other words, the present or absence of negative emotion. Mm -hmm. How does it actually feel? We can be giving in a way that, in which we feel the love flowing through us. We're tired, but we're at peace. There's a lot of compassion going on. Uh, we don't have a sense of injustice or being abused or used. On the other hand, maybe we're in the same situation. We're saying the same words. We're doing the same actions. We're brushing the same hair. We're emptying the same dishwasher. But deep down inside, there's negative emotion. We feel mistreated. We feel let down. Uh, we feel like, you know, but what about me? So that, that's a key difference there, I think. Okay. Here's my next and last question for you. Uh, 
you know, you use language like the, the Gottfried Protocol, the hormone cure, you know, you're willing to just take the big swing, so I'm with you. Um, looking out at the world today, maybe even thinking about the world, your children, my children are going to inherit, our children, everybody's children are going to inherit. If there was one thing that you could get everybody in the world doing for five minutes every day, or at least a critical mass, for me it's about a billion brains I think about, that's where I think the tipping point is. If you could get some critical mass of human beings doing something or not doing something for five minutes or so a day, what would that be? Mm. Immediate answer is to put your hand on your heart and close your eyes, hopefully you're not driving, and say, <laughs> what went well? What went well today? What went well in the past 24 hours? It's a twist on a gratitude list. It's something that, you know, it's kind of a, a mashup of uh, uh, Marty Seligman's work and some of the studies he's done where he suggests doing this at night before you go to bed. But if we just had five minutes any time during the day, I would say hand over the heart, mm -hmm. what went well, yeah. and just really connecting to that and breathing into it. It's one of the ways of amplifying oxytocin. We haven't even talked about the hormone of love bonding and social affiliation. But I think we need more oxytocin, not less. We live in an oxytocin deficient world. And just that one tweak of raising oxytocin through connecting on a heart level and amplifying gratitude, very powerful. That's great. Well, you inducted me into that, just the way your voice changed and just the idea of it was really great. Well, Sarah Gottfried, a great pleasure. Uh, the book, The Hormone Cure, you've got two websites, sarahgottfriedmd.com, and then it sounded like Sarah, Sarah Gottfried or The Hormone Cure, the book, uh, right? Full of resources for people. Thehormonecurebook.com, yes. Thehormonecurebook.com, that's great. So full of resources in both places. Thank you again, Sarah. This has been a real pleasure to talk with you, and I really wish you the very best. You're making a lot of contribution to the world. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.